I want to start by just quickly reviewing, and I want to make this quick because I feel like what we have to talk about is, is really important today, and I want to give, I, I loved the, the discussion that we had toward the end last week. When, when our children are securely attached, they have the increased capacity to enjoy healthy intimacy. Um, and that means intimacy in a variety of different categories. Beginning in childhood, they learn that they reach for others when they feel stressed or anxious. That is what secure attachment looks like. And as they learn to do that in the, in the context of the relationships with their parents, first of all, um, they, it transitions over into their ability to do so in relationships with friends. Um, and then into the adolescent years as they're exploring dating relationships. And then, of course, if it goes well, they have an increased capacity to look for others that can treat them with um, love and respect and then become securely attached to an intimate marriage partner. That's sort of the, the path that we all hope to take. So as we, as we come to a place where we enjoy healthy intimacy... There are, there, y it kind of depends on where you look, but there are a lot of different categories of healthy intimacy. Um, but you could break it down into emotional intimacy, intellectual intimacy, spiritual intimacy, um, physical intimacy, which is sort of non-sexual <coughs> touch, and then, of course, sexual intimacy. And since today and what we're talking about is, is um, kind of in the realm of addiction and around sexuality, I wanted to start by defining what that is, what healthy sexual intimacy is. So I'll just go ahead and read this. Okay, so healthy sexuality is most easily and sensitively understood as a fully embodied expression of a deep, loving connection between two individuals that is protected by boundaries of exclusivity as an and is an enhancement of emotional and spiritual intimacy. And I often talk, I work a lot, I think I mentioned before, I work a lot with adolescents. And we talk a lot about these paths coming together. And that if one is out front and far be before the others, especially in our, in our sort of the society where a lot of our adolescents struggle with balancing that and sexuality is really sort of thrown in front of them culturally, I talk about if there is sexual intimacy before the others, we are off balance and there is going to be a lot of problems. And it kind of frames for the adolescents... Um, and sort of helps them look at it from a different perspective than what they may see, like the norm, you know, in their high schools and things like that. So, so that's the healthy end. I wanted to kind of throw that out there before we move toward what sexual addiction is. And I want to define that as a pathological relationship to a, to a mood-altering experience, the use of a sexual activity for the purpose of lessening pain by a person who has lost control over the rate, frequency, or duration of use and whose life is becoming progressively unmanageable as a result. Okay, so what that means, to kind of put it in a nutshell, is again, this kind of goes back, and this hopefully builds on what we talked about last week, which is this. When we struggle with reaching in anxiety, we look for a non-relational way to become soothed. And that really kind of covers the, the blanket of any sort of addictive behavior. Um, and it can be gambling, it can be alcohol, drug use, um, gaming, and in this particular context, we're talking more about um, sexual addiction. So it can be through, through sexuality. All right, now this is, this is kind of the, uh, we are living in a world where if you're going to try to soothe non-relationally, we are in sort of a tsunami where sexual addiction is, is rampant, more even than a lot of the other addictions. And the reason is because um, what we call the AAA engine effect, which means that we live in a world where it is accessible, it's, always, it's around, easy to find, you don't have to like sneak into a store or anything like that, it's affordable, in many ways it's, you know, it's free, and it's anonymous, it can be done in the privacy of our own home. And so if somebody is struggling with intimacy and they need soothing, this is a very easy way to find, for a moment, a temporary place to become soothed. And if you add to that the struggles that um, adolescents already have through their healthy sexuality, meaning that they're, you know, I talk to my adolescents when I'm working with them and saying, this is in many ways very normal. Like, when you are 12, 13, 14, you're interested in the opposite gender. I mean, that's how God made us. He made us relational. And so, 
if there's not a conversation about that, and we're going to talk a whole bunch about that next time I meet with you, but if there's already this healthy need, something that's already sort of a part of who we are, but then you combine that with anxiety, and then you combine that with this accessibility to something, and then you combine that with sort of the normalization of this in school. One of the, I work with a young man who's, who's working to overcome some addiction of this nature, and he said 80% of the kids at his school look at pornography, and it is not a big deal. I mean, that's, I mean maybe that's not mind-blowing to you. It's very sad, but that is the, that is the world that our, our youth live in. And so it's all over the place, it's very, very normalized, and they have no idea, in many cases, what's actually going on. And so, are there any questions or comments before I move on? I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain now, so I'm going to take, I'm going to to shift gears a little bit. Are we good? All right. Okay, so I want to start by talking about the impact that um, pornography has on the brain, but I want to start again by talking about what a healthy brain looks like. So, this is really interesting, because if you look at this, when I was doing this research, it blew my mind, because these are the components of a healthy brain, and these are also the components that they find in a child or an individual, an adult, who is securely attached. And so, if we want to shore our children up and our adolescents up, and help them develop into the competent individuals that we want them to be, to serve God and community, our securely attached relationships with them will give them this bonus, okay? So, those with a healthy brain enjoy the following. They have the ability to be attuned in their communication, meaning that they can attune to others, that they can stay focused. They're able to regulate their bodies. In other words, our bodies have like a, it's like, I kind of like to think of it as like a, um, the, the gas and the brakes, and they're able to regulate their bodies and know sort of when to go and when to stop, okay? The next is that they have response flexibility, which means that they are able to pause before they make a choice as to what they're going to do. Now, mind you, I need to throw out there, these characteristics are not developed in even a healthy child or adolescent <laughs> at all, <laughs> all right? So it's a developing thing. But by the mid-20s, if you're securely attached, this is what you should look for, okay? Um, but, you know, we'll, I was out on the boat with my 14-year-old daughter yesterday, and I'm thinking, whoa, we are like zero for eight today. <laughs> so, having a hard day. <laughs> so, um, intuition is another one, sort of a sixth or, you know, even like a seventh sense. Um, insight, sort of a sense of a map of me, like those who are securely attached, have a sense of what I am, who, what I'm experiencing, and empathy is a map of you. I can look at you in, my, in a relationship, and I can understand what you're feeling. And that's a really, really um, important trait that isn't always developed. You'll notice in your children, they don't, they don't have a, a sense of empathy often. It's not developed quite yet, but it becomes developed. The more I have an understanding of me, and the more I have an understanding of you, I can communicate in ways that are effective and that bring about healthy intimacy. The next one is emotion regulation. It's sort of we all kind of have ups and downs. We don't really want to live in a flatline world, right? We want to feel happy and joyful, and we want to be able to transition in a comfortable way that doesn't, so that we're not always like, whoa, you know, too um, over, overwhelmed emotionally, but also that when we're sad, we can sort of bring ourselves up. All right, the next one is fear modulation, that when we feel fear, it doesn't overwhelm us. And then the final one is morality. So when our brains are healthy, and when our brains, and, and, when, we come, and, and when we have healthy, attached relationships, this is what we can kind of look for. And when I work with my, my, my youth, and when I work with those who are sort of in recovery, I, I pay attention to where they are in these areas. Because oftentimes when I start first visiting with them, I can tell very easily that we're not there. All right, so I'm going to move on to what happens in the brain through addiction. Um, yeah, so let's move on. And so, so malfunctions of the porn sick brain, and this is really, really an interesting picture. What it shows is, so, so just to give you just a little bit of a sense of what's going on in the, kind of in the neurobiology of addiction, when we are exposed to a chemical, and specifically in... Um, 
pornography, the chemical, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's called dopamine, and it floods the brain at huge rates, and it eventually begins to eat into the brain. So if you notice the slide a couple before, it was, it was sort of cleaner, and there was some sort of, um, it just looks different. It almost looks like there are holes going on. When one exposes themselves to pornography, it has an incredibly powerful impact. The way I like to think of it is, if you think of taking drugs, like street drugs, you are, you are imposing into your body a chemical, obviously, right? The thing that's very interesting about pornography is it's almost like we have an inner drug dealer. And when we, ex when we look at pornography, it is actually a drug that we can produce from inside of our bodies already that floods our brain and has a serious impact on it. The closest correlation that they find to what the brain does with pornography is, when, is cocaine. And so it looks the same. The, the sort of the long-term effects of, of pornography are the same as the, as the impact of one who has um, a long-term addiction to cocaine. All right, before, I know that's a real downer. I will say, just to sort of throw in there, um, you know, to offer some hope and healing, the brain has characteristics of plasticity, which means that it can be healed. All right, because often I've said that before, and I have people coming up who, you know, have no, know or love people that have struggled with a sort of this, dic this um, an addiction of this nature, and there's like a lot of hopelessness, like I've, I've damaged my brain, or he or she have damaged their brain. It can be healed. You know, by the grace of God, the brain can be healed. It is not an easy process, and it is not a fast process, but it is one that can, that, that it can happen. So when one struggles with this, this sort of addiction, this is what they experience. They have, an, they have an inability to connect emotionally with themselves and with others. They struggle with attention span issues. They are very impulsive. In other words, they have intention to do something, but when something clicks and they go into sort of an alter state, they're very, very quick to move, and they don't think about the consequences. All right? Um, they struggle with organization. They struggle with judgment. They lack empathy and insight, meaning they don't have a clear sense of even who they are and what they're feeling, and then they struggle with what you, know, what you are and who, what you're feeling, and they don't have sort of forward-thinking skills. The research has shown that one who struggles with addiction looks a lot like one who has a brain injury to the frontal lobe because the part of the brain that is responsible for healthy attachment, you know, secure attachment and the sort of the secure sort of the healthy brain is the prefrontal cortex. It's right behind the forehead. And that is what develops into the teens and through, you know, mid-20s is when the prefrontal cortex is fully developed. And when one struggles with these things, the prefrontal cortex does not develop well at all. It's not even actually very well connected to the part of the brain, the middle brain, which is the limbic system. So you have the brain stem here. The limbic system is the emotion center of the brain. And the prefrontal cortex is right here. It's, it's like if this, was, if this was me. This would be my forehead, OK? All right? Now, as children are developing, what happens is, is this stays down. And slowly but surely, as time goes by and they have securely attached relationships, the, think, the, the feeling brain and the thinking brain begin to form neuro, so that it's like neurons stick together like this, and they, and they combine so that whatever you're thinking or feeling is filtered through what you're thinking and you're able to sort of process, this is what I'm feeling, and you're able to have this capacity to stop and reason and think and feel, and it goes through the part of the brain that is the thinking portion of the brain, okay? All right, now when a brain injury happens, this front part is compromised, you know, in many ways completely. When there's no secure attachment, the child is so anxious that this part of the brain actually separates. And, and if you listen to, uh, there's a great scholar by the name of Dan Siegel who speaks often of this, he refers to this as flipping your lid. Like, you, we've all done it. When we lose our patience and we are mad and angry, our lid flips. The feeling brain and the thinking brain stop talking to each other. All right, and I've talked to my kids about this, and I've started to realize, you know, I've flipped my lid. <laughs> or he's flipped his lid, or she's flipped her lid. We don't have conflict resolution in our family when it is apparent that our lids are flipped. All right, that's why sometimes we just need a minute. 
And that minute, what happens in that minute is the thinking brain re-engages with the feeling brain and we're able to engage again in repair. So we can get back to our batting average, you know, our, high, our 33% good enough parenting, right? All right, so what that means then is when there are struggles with addiction, these two parts of the brain just don't talk to each other because there's such an erosion in the front part of the brain, in the prefrontal cortex, all right? That's a lot to kind of take in. I know that little, little science lesson here. Is there anybody that would like to have any questions? Uh, questions and responses? Because I don't know that I could make an answer, but I can sure try. Or I can move on. Yes? Is this true for any addictive brain? Yes. Not just pornography? Yeah, I, I think pornography is a little bit... Um, my understanding, I should say, is that because of the, the intensity of the chemicals that are involved in, in a pornography addiction, it is very, it's, it's probably to some degree um, more salient. Um, but yeah, it's, it's true of really any addiction. As a matter of fact, they have found, and it's, it's kind of a circular thing, those who struggle with ADHD look like they have, they, they, it's almost like you don't know which is which. When I see somebody who struggles with ADHD, oftentimes they struggle also with um, sexual addiction because they look the very same. And often, you, you know, and that's not to say it always is the case. I'm not, I mean, I'm not oversimplifying at all. But what it's doing is it's basically saying it has the same impact. They look the same, and it's, it's hard to know, you know, if one led to the other or the other led to the, you know, it's just, it's really, really tricky. Does that kind of answer your question? And so <clears throat> these symptoms right. are not necessarily diagnostic of an addiction. It could be diagnostic of... Attachment issues. ADD, attachment mm -hmm. issues. Trauma. Right. It's just basically saying that the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that develops, that gives us our ability to have insight, empathy, um, you know, all of those things from the previous slide, those things are developing well when we have secure attachment and also when our brains are not overwhelmed with dopamine. And the dopamine overwhelm is what brings about these struggles. Sometimes it also can happen in severe cases of abuse or neglect. Yeah. All right, okay, so let's just spend a few minutes talking about the addiction cycle um, because what's going, so, so, so when somebody has these, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned last week that 97% of those who struggle with sexual addiction have a sort of first world neglect history in their family of origin where they lived in families that were um, very kind of emotionally struggled with responsiveness, where there wasn't sort of allowed a full range of emotions, where there wasn't a lot of mirroring going on, um, sometimes very punitive, or just sometimes very, very disengaged. Um, so when that happens, sometimes, uh, a lot of times those who I see um, begin in their early teens. That's sort of um, a normal age. Usually they're exposed, yeah, in this day and age, exposure to pornography is around the age of nine. Some studies show it's even as early as the age of seven but they become um, increasingly addicted usually in the early teen years, and the cycle looks like this. All right, so what ends up happening, I want you to start at preoccupation, which means that they become anxious. Something goes on in their world. It doesn't even have to be that big of a, a deal. It could be um, they weren't invited to hang out with a friend, you know, group. They missed, you know, they see something on Instagram and they're not invited or... Um, some conflict with a teacher or a parent or just loneliness. Um, some of the folks that I work with don't even know what their triggers are. They just know that they get anxious and they feel alone and they want to feel better. And they've come to learn that they can temporarily feel better by this, this hit of this drug that they've learned that they have access to within their bodies. All right, so it brings about impaired thinking where those who struggle across the board, at least in my experience, they don't want to do this. These are not perverts. I mean, that is the truth. These are not people that go out there and they love this experience. They, their thinking becomes impaired. They don't. They kind of stop thinking about what does this mean? Who am I hurting? How is this impacting me? How is this impacting those I love? All of that just sort of goes away. And their thinking becomes impaired and they begin to go through sort of some ritualistic behaviors to get themselves alone. And it's almost like they go into a little bit of a trance. Then they experience the acting out behaviors, um, whatever those are. Um, there's escalating behaviors that often take place. Oftentimes it just begins um, by looking at something. It becomes accompanied by masturbation. And then there are those that, you know, it, it escalates to where 
it's hurting other people and it's outside of the home and it can be um, something that can have them ending up in jail. Um, so, so they act out and immediately upon whatever their acting out behavior of choices, they spiral into a huge abyss of shame and despair. And they feel worthless. And they think to themselves, they pull, they're not in the trance anymore, they're back to themselves, and they feel hopeless. And so they live in this place of hopelessness and depression, and what's wrong with me? Um, they try to live through that and work through that and sort of normalize their own, you know, whatever they're experiencing, and then they move back into preoccupation because oftentimes the deep shame brings them to a place where they don't want to feel that way anymore and they don't know how to reach. They don't know how to become soothed relationally. They feel worthless and alone and they don't know what to do and they feel stuck. And so sadly, they often spiral back around the circle again. And many people that I know and that I've been um, honored to work with have been in this hell for sometimes 20 to 30 years. And I love these people with all my heart. So I want to spend a minute talking to you about what they're experiencing because I feel that we are called as a community to minister to those who struggle with this because we all struggle. We are all broken. And we are called of God to be instruments in his hands to help wherever we can. Remember that the origin of any kind of addiction is isolation. So number one, never ever isolate one who is struggling with any kind of addiction. And because in this day and age, sort of the addiction of choice, the flavor of choice is sexual addiction, we should never ever isolate someone who is struggling with this kind of addiction. I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about some experiences that have changed my life and taught me the power of healing when we understand how devastating shame is and kind of distinguish for you the difference between shame and guilt. And I want you to bear with me. I've taken some notes because I really, really want to get this right. So I'd like to take you back with me to a couple of places where I learned a great deal about the worth of souls. First, come with me you would to a high school here in the in the greater Kansas City metro where many of the kids struggled a lot this was a very very low socioeconomic school and at this time I was training to become a counselor and I was sitting around a table running a group with six young women all of whom displayed a variety a very a lot of degrees of self-expression they had tattoos and a multitude of body piercings crazy hair and many of them wore hoodies to cover their faces and cover their downcast eyes. As we began working together, I will admit to you, I was a little scared of them. They were a, they were a tough crowd, and they didn't act like they wanted to be there, and they, they looked a little bit mean and angry. But slowly, as I learned more about them, I came to love these girls very deeply. I came to not care how many mistakes they had made, or what their grades were, or how they smelled, or what they wore, or what they didn't wear. I just loved these girls. And this pure love, this love that was based on no preconditions whatsoever, drew them to me, and I saw these adolescent ice sculptures melt before my eyes as they began to feel something that many of them had never felt before, which was my pure and unconditional acceptance and love. One day I began to visit with them about choices that we make and the difference between shame and guilt when we've made a poor choice. I said to them that when we feel guilty, we realize that we have behaved in a way that is below who deep down inside we know that we are. We have a sense of our inner worth, our goodness, and our lovability, and we realize that our actions have not matched who we really are. And so consequently, we feel bad and we try to align our behavior and our relationships with our true identity. 
When we feel guilt or godly sorrow, as the Apostle Paul called it, we move towards others and God, and we find connection and healing. On the other hand, shame is a deep sense of our unlovability, our unworthiness, and our badness, and it's a feeling that we are not worthy of love and belonging. When we behave badly and when we feel shame, we do not move towards others, but we see our actions rather as proof of our worthlessness. When we feel shame, we move away from connection with others, and we live in a place of loneliness and suffering. So in guilt, we say, I made a mistake. In shame, we say, I am a mistake. When I asked these sweet girls if they could each sense their own immense worth, they just stared at me in belief or despair. Obviously, shame was all too familiar to them. I looked into their eyes and I said, Girls, you are worthy of love. That came with your birth into this world. I don't know how you came to feel worthless or not good enough for love, but you have my love, and I accept you just because you are you. Tears streamed down all of their faces as I taught them this truth. Since I was in a public school setting, sadly, I could not articulate that I was only communicating to them God's own truth. However, I hope that as they looked into my eyes, as I told them of their own worth, and I told them that it was not connected to anything that they had done, but, but just because they were who they were, I was hopefully acting as a window through which they could begin to see God's love for them. Now, I want to take you to a second place that also changed my life forever. This time, I was in the basement of an old, run-down, non-denominational church at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I'm also enrolled in a graduate studies class on addiction. And in this small group this week, there was a gentleman who was there for the first time. So when somebody comes to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting for the first time, the protocol is that at least one other member shares their journey of recovery with the new member to offer some support and hope and healing. So one man, an older, gruff, life-hardened gentleman, testified of his fight and how he was able to finally overcome his demon by drawing upon the power of God and community, which eventually saved his, was, was in the process of saving his body, had saved his marriage, and was helping him save other sacred relationships in his life. He spoke with humility, with a deep passion to help others, and most importantly, I noticed that this man spoke with a sense of his own deep worthiness of God's love for him despite his brokenness. His own sense of worth led him to feel guilt or godly sorrow about how his actions had impacted him and others and it moved him to move towards God and minister towards others to help them find hope and meaning and eventually healing. So as this meeting came to a close, I was invited to stand in a circle and hold hands with these new, noble friends of mine and listen as one of the members offered prayer to God in gratitude and thanksgiving for his loving kindness on them in their various places of struggle. I have never felt the stronger presence of God in any moment in my life than I did with this group of people leaning upon God as he honored him as a source of hope and healing. Surely this man taught me that God loves broken things. And as I further contemplated this prayer and what I learned about the beauty of brokenness, I contemplated my own brokenness, not because I'm an alcoholic, but because I am uniquely broken and flawed in my own way, and I need God and a Savior just as much as any of these men did. You see, our ability to approach God has nothing to do with our individual sins and everything to do with our deep sense that we are worthy of his love regardless of those sins. 
if we can see ourselves from a place of deeply known worthiness of God's love, then we have the courage to approach him and ask him to help us, which includes, and is mo- and which is most importantly includes our ability to understand and receive the healing that comes from the, uh, the power of Jesus' atonement. We each struggle. We each need the loving arms of a father or a mother or a teacher or a friend or a spiritual leader to help us when we don't feel lovable or worthy and probably especially when we don't feel lovable or worthy. And it causes me to think about myself as a mother. When I am with my children and they make a mistake, how am I responding to them? Do I communicate through my words or actions what's wrong with you? Or I will love you and you'll be worthy of my love only after you shape up? If I seem to place conditions on their worthiness to receive my love, I am setting my children up to start to feel shame, to struggle and to eventually begin to hide from me, from others, and eventually from God himself. If I am shaming my loved ones, I need to always remember that shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, eating disorders, violence, bullying, and aggression. And the miracle of this concept is that guilt is inversely correlated with each of these things. So if I have the capacity to sit with my children and to love them and help them feel guilt or that godly sorrow that I keep referring back to, if I help them feel this, in, as they're making these choices while also wrapping them in the blanket of God's innate worthiness of each of us, then I am leading them back into God's arms every day of my life with them. And this is true of all of our relationships. In any other formal or informal capacity where we have influence over the fragile lives of any others in our circles and we all have influence over people in our world, I just want us to think about being really careful about using that word worthiness. Because our worth is never on the line in God's eyes. We might pass through valleys of personal struggle, but this is a state. This is something that is temporary. Our worthiness is an inborn trait, something that endures for eternity. So to close with you today, I want to take you to one final gathering. And in this short narrative, we can join our first parents, Adam and Eve, who had partaken of the forbidden fruit and they chose to hide. So if we look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, we read, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? I've often thought about this phrase. Why does God ask them where they are? We know God knows where they are. I believe that God is reaching out to them to help them see that he always wants his beloved children to draw near to him, even in moments when they may wish to hide in shame. Just as he wanted Adam and Eve to stay near him in like manner, no matter what we're struggling with, he wants us to stay near to him too so that we might partake of the blessings that come through him to us because of his divine plan for each of us. I have come to feel deeply that no matter where each of us are in our own journeys back to God, we are doing the best that we can. I have also come to see that when I have the chance to be near one who is struggling and facing shame and fear, and in this case, one who is facing addiction that may seem hopeless, that my kindness, my love, and my acceptance will lead them back to repentance, forgiveness, and healing and the sure knowledge of God's love every single time more quickly than any kind of shaming, judgment, criticism, or alienation. So it is my hope that we all here in this room today can be a window through which others may fill of God's unconditional love and that through each of us, others can come to know that the worth of their souls is great, even infinite, in the sight of God. And I share these things in our Lord's name. Amen.